Welcome to Four Speed Ahead, I'm Craig Fuller. Today we're gonna to talk about the truck stop story. It's a, a company that was bootstrapped by Scott Mostra, sold, or it took a, a minority investment from Sagemont in 2016, and ended up selling a, a large majority share to Iconic in 2019. And so we're gonna talk about the entire journey of what it was like being a part of the truck stop story and uh, what the future looks like for the truck stop team. With me here today is Phil Gates, the founding partner at Sagemart, and Paris Cole, the CEO of Truck Stop. Uh, welcome guys, how are you? Good, doing well. So let's start, Paris, uh, let's start talking a little bit about the truck stop story. What led you guys to take the investment from Sage Mount? Um, and why Sage Mount specifically did, did you uh, take that investment from? Yeah, so yeah, I, I would say back, uh, back in 2015, uh, as Scott and I and the, the rest of the, the leadership team, as we talked about our opportunities going forward, we, we realized uh, a couple of things. One is, you know, being based in New Plymouth, Idaho, it's not exact exactly the capital uh, 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 capital raising capital of the the country. You know, we weren't on one of the coasts, we weren't really known, and we felt like we needed a partner to help us tell our story. Uh, we also wanted a partner to help us open doors uh, for us that we couldn't otherwise. And then, last of all, we uh, we wanted a partner that had experience in. Uh, transportation logistics and in payments and in marketplaces, as well as a partner that could help us operationally uh, improve in, in a number of different areas. And so uh, that's what we went into the process uh, looking for. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, we actually were, were found by, by Sage Mount before we even started our process. Uh, uh, Phil and the team started reaching out to us as early well, with me as early as, as 2013, and they, they started- Craig, a quick, uh, a quick interjection there, sorry to cut you off, Ferris, but uh, we used to pretend that we were gonna be in the area, which uh, which is funny if you know New, New Plymouth, <laughs> Idaho, which is 55 miles northwest of Boise. The only reason you'd be in Northwest Idaho if you're not uh, milking cows is to see truckstop.com. And so, so it, it wasn't very savvy when we said, we're gonna be in the area, can we stop by Paris? He's like, no one's just in the area. <laughs> That's funny. I use that line quite a bit. Uh, fortunately, it works for me when I'm in San Francisco or New York to raise capital uh, because people actually believe I'm in the area for reasons. Uh, so, so Paris, when, when, you were thinking, when you guys were thinking about this process, moving from a bootstrap uh, company, you know, founder-driven, founder-funded company, I imagine that was you had to think about things differently as you brought in an outside investor. What was that transition like? Yeah, it, you know, there was a, a lot of discussion. Uh, at, at that point in time, uh, we had been uh, around for nearly 20 years and led by Scott for 20 years. And, and so to bring on an outside party, even an, uh, even if it was a minority investment, we, we knew that the dynamics were going to change. Uh, but that's, that's what we wanted. Uh, you know, for us, we wanted an outside party to come in, help us. So it, it really, the transition really wasn't too difficult. I would say the other big key to that is is that we were in a great place financially. Uh, we we didn't we didn't need the capital. Uh, so for us, it was really about finding the right partner more than it was finding the additional capital. And and so we could go into the process a little bit differently in terms of what we were looking for, and and really really hone in on on the the partner themselves and. You know, Phil and, and the team have been a great partner. Um, so it, obviously they brought capital, which is great. You know, that was helpful too. Uh, but that wasn't the primary purpose for doing the deal. In fact, Craig, we took profitability as a group meaningfully backwards during the first uh, 18 to 24 months of our investment horizon to uh, both accelerate organic growth as well as, you know, kind of further enhance the velocity of the uh, the innovation and the tech development that, that Paris Scott and the team were, were pushing out. What was it like taking, I mean, you guys do a lot of investments in uh, founder-driven bootstrap companies, but what was the transition like? As a founder, uh, I know that at some point that becomes, you know, having uh, an exit becomes a part of my story. What is it, what's that like for you guys? 
about 85% of the time we're investing in uh, bootstrapped founder backed companies, Craig. So I guess, you know, by, uh, by history and experience, it's, uh, it's been something that we, you know, really enjoy um, the the passion that comes with partnering up with uh, innovative and entrepreneurial management teams is is pretty cool stuff. What was awesome about this transition is that uh, Scott really uh, wanted the transition to uh, being the, a strategic technology leader in the business from the chairman seat uh, and and uh, accelerated uh, Paris's transition to CEO, sort of roughly at the same timing of of our transit uh, transaction. So. That worked out, you know, exceptionally well because Scott got to focus on what he was really, you know, what he jumps out of bed for every day. And Paris got to, you know, institutionalize the business in ways that Scott was less excited about around, you know, taking an inside sales and go to market team from, you know, 10 people to 85 people and and building out, you know, a, a scalable business that could, you know, 3x, you know, which is which is what we did from a revenue perspective during our during our hold period. And so the, the transition was uh, was really seamless in this case. It, it isn't always, but in this case, it was. And I think it was the receptivity of the team. In fact, if we were brainstorming in a session on a on a Tuesday afternoon in the uh, back when we were in New Plymouth, they have offices in you know, Boise, Chicago, uh, Phoenix, et cetera. But when we were in New Plymouth, there might be a, an idea ideation session on a Tuesday afternoon, and by Wednesday morning. The developers had stayed up all night, implemented it, and had you know rolled out in situ marketing and you know in the platform by the morning. We were watching to see what the receptivity was from the uh, from the network, uh, which was which is pretty cool stuff. You guys grew the revenues by three hundred percent in three years. Uh, approximately, yeah. That's uh, that's pretty incredible. And what do you account that to? What's the what's really the reason you think that that level of growth happened during your your investment? I bring it down into the two obvious components uh, on the organic side. Uh, the business went from sort of consistently a, a double digit, but sort of call it low double digit grower to, you know, 45 to 50 percent uh, on a run rate basis on, on exit. And that was there was a lot of work that Paris and, and uh, the go to market team put into uh, accomplishing that. Uh, and then we supplemented that uh, that growth on the inorganic side with uh, with three acquisitions, uh, sort of a tiny, uh, small, and uh, a medium-sized acquisition that added uh, tech capabilities. And then, you know, the larger acquisition enhanced our, our capabilities on the payment side of the world. And so, as we were as we were rolling out load pay organically, we were able to su uh, supplement that with uh, DNS Factors, which is a business that Scott's sister built over time. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Uh, Phil, when you were looking at businesses to invest in, you guys obviously get a lot of deal flow. Did you seek out TruckStop? How did you discover TruckStop and why specifically TruckStop? As you mentioned, it's not a company that's easy to get to, uh, the headquarters. So I'd love to hear that uh, story of, of why TruckStop and, and how you guys discovered each other. Perfect. So I, I first reached out to Scott in 2006, 2007 timeframe. He was not interested in, uh, he was interested in building a relationship, but not interested in uh, a, a partnership at that point. That, that led to an acquisition in uh, freightquote.com with, with Tim Martin uh, when I was at a predecessor firm. And then, as you mentioned, uh, uh, with Gene, co-founded SageMount uh, in 2012. Uh, Matt Coven, who's uh, one of my colleagues and a principal at the firm now, reached out to Paris and developed a, a relationship. Um, so we had a couple of touch points in, into the business. Uh, we love network affected marketplaces, marketplace businesses. Uh, and so just generally speaking, then specifically within logistics tech, uh, we've now made nine platform investments and about 30 tuck-in acquisitions in, in logistics tech in, in the eight and a half years that SageMount's been been up and running. And as I mentioned with Freight Quote and uh, some Sterile met some other deals that uh, consummated at a prior firm. It was an area that we that we knew and liked, and so we felt like the innovation clay was there to mold and just needed to be you know unlocked with uh, with Paris's leadership and the, the new management team and and Scott's role as the uh, as the, the tech oriented founder of the business. Now, Paris, I got to ask you: You're taking on the reins from a founder. As a founder, it's always you are sort of tied into your business. And I think about Truck Stop in the mid 2000s. Most people identify Truck Stop as Scott's business. Um, what was that like transitioning from a founder-driven company for you and being a CEO uh, and still having the founder uh, play a role as chairman? Yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of the the credit in the transition goes to Scott. Uh, uh, I, I was the CFO uh, for two and a half years before I formally became CEO. 
But really that last year or so, uh, most of the critical decisions uh, Scott was allowing me to make. So sort of behind the scenes, uh, Scott and I would talk and uh, he would uh, defer to me usually uh, when we make that decision. So while I formally wasn't the CEO until late 2015, in, in substance, I was acting as the CEO in, in many ways uh, uh, behind the scenes uh, before then. And so, you know, I, and, and again, I think it's it's been difficult at times for Scott, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, not every decision that uh, that I've made has Scott agreed with, but he's always supported me, whether he agreed with it or not, which has been uh, really fantastic. And, and uh, uh, thankfully, you know, I've got a great team around me and we've had some great success. So o overall, I think we've made uh, you know, some great decisions and we've had uh, a great amount of success. But, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, I, I'm sure for Scott, if you were to ask him, it, you know, at, at times it's been maybe uh, a little bit uh, uh, nerve wracking or you know a little bit hesitant on some of the changes that we've made because uh, uh, they wouldn't have been changes that Scott would have made. But I, I think that's been part of the success is I bring a different skill set and a different perspective than Scott has. And I, I think for our stage of growth and where we're at, that's that's what was needed. Yeah, it's always been a founder and transitioning to a management team. I've been fortunate my board has encouraged that. Uh, effectively, you end up firing yourself from every job because you, you, the people that you hire are better at doing the jobs than you are. Um, but it's, it is a transition. It is one that is uh, both exciting because you realize as the largest shareholder of the company, you benefit from your investment uh, performing quite well. Uh, but it's also uh, somewhat discerning because you, you, you built this, this business in many ways as your baby, and so it's hard to sort of make that transition. It's oftentimes an uh, empty nest and syndrome for founders. Um, I'm curious, the, Phil, when you, when you guys came into the, in the business, you saw lots of opportunity. You, you identified growth. You talked about the explosive hockey stick growth that, uh, that came during the period that you guys were an investor. Where do you credit the, uh, the impact of Sagemount coming into the business? Where would you guys say that you had the most influence on the growth of the truck stop story? I would probably point to the organic side. Uh, and, and it was implemented by the management team and, and we had great leadership on the on the sales and marketing side and, and obviously ultimately led by Paris as, as well. Uh, we have a team uh, led by Kurt Witte called Sage Mount Growth Factors, uh, which is our answer to what what else do we bring to the table besides just you know strategic counsel and capital? And uh, and growth factors is um, free of charge and as requested by our management team. So it's not a dictatorial approach to, you know, an operating partner or a playbook or that type of thing. So it's very situation specific and each solution for each particular company is, uh, is bespokely creative created. Uh, and so in the case of, of truck stop, it was getting the right uh, combination of uh, enterprise orientation uh, with, you know, inside sales. And, and obviously I think Paris would agree with this, the life, a lot of, a lot of, Truck stop all along has been, you know, that that carrier base, that modern day cowboy that is the the U.S. trucker who's doing so much for for our country, getting goods goods across the business and keeping the economy rolling. How can we make their day, you know, that much more efficient, um, make their their life that much more mu that much more fruitful? So how do you reach them? They're a hard uh, constituency to reach, given you know the obvious constraints of uh, of rolling across. The, across the country. And when they get home, they want to spend time with family, not necessarily, you know, logging into apps or, or otherwise. And so I think building out that uh, organic capability and the go-to-market strategy around the organic side is probably where, where I'd point, and Paris can correct me where I'm wrong, where I'd point is where SageMount really helps move the needle. Yeah, I would say that would be the primary area. Uh, certainly, you know, I uh, Kurt and his team did uh, a phenomenal job uh, helping us uh, through our journey. Uh, so that was fantastic. I, I would also talk about the support that, that Phil and the, uh, uh, the rest of the team gave us on the, uh, the M&A side as well, though. You know, that, that was part of our story. I would say a minor part, but certainly a, a part of it. And uh, we, I, we had countless discussions about uh, these, uh, the three acquisitions that we did over uh, Sage Mount's investment. And uh, you know, a, a lot of back and forth, and, and uh, uh, we, our team really relied on uh, on the Sage Mount team to help us 
uh, through those uh, those acquisitions, whether it was thinking about how to structure the deal or actually doing uh, diligence on the deal, they, they helped us with both. And, and it was uh, you know just a great partnership. Greg, I think another area where we, we prided ourselves in getting our, our fingers dirty a little bit was on the payment side. Uh, payments is an area in addition to logistics tech where we've, we've had a lot of historical investing experience. Uh, the independent board member that, uh, that we brought to the table, but Scott and Paris ultimately invited to join the board, Roy Banks, uh, has been a, uh, you know, a, a an executive that we've backed in the past and and uh, someone who I think was helpful to uh, to truck stops as they rolled out their uh, their their payment strategy, uh, which you know included load pay organically as well as the the D, you know the DNS factors uh, integration. And my partner Blair Greenberg's pretty deep in payments, and uh, he he really dug in on that point. And as as uh, Sarah said, Gerald Costado on our at our shop really. A lot, a lot, lost a lot of sleep getting those acquisitions uh, integrated. So it was, a, it was definitely a team effort. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a freight guy, trucking guy with a payment addiction because I spent 10 years in payments and certainly understand the opportunities and just how historically the payment to carriers and uh, collecting from shippers, just how difficult that process is and fraught with both opportunities and challenges. So um, I, I certainly applaud you guys for marrying up the marketplace with the payment uh, and settlement vehicle, because I think that that's, uh, that's quite, quite uh, instinctive and, and smart. So Phil, when you guys came into the business, obviously, you know, as an investor, you're looking for a return you're thinking about how do we position this company for growth and then how do we position it for exit. What was the uh, steps that you guys took to think about exit and was the iconic investment, was that something that uh, they approached the truck stop team or approached you guys or did it happen with uh, the, an outreach of a banker uh, that was involved in the process? Sure. Uh, as, as we entered the investment period, even predating our investment, we sat down with Paris and talked about our, our mission, if you will. And, and our mission was what we were trying to accomplish over a three to four year period of time. Um, and it was both, you know, quantitative metrics, you know, growth, acceleration, M&A, et cetera, but also um, aspects of, you know, innovative velocity on the technology rollout side, uh, cultural aspects of the business, best places to work in each of our respective cities, et cetera. And, uh, at, at kind of the end of 2018, uh, the board sat down and said, you know, gosh, it doesn't always happen this way, but we've accomplished, we've checked almost every box, if not every box of those uh, of those missions. You know, behind the scenes, uh, similar to us, Iconic had been reaching out uh, to uh, Paris and team about establishing a, a relationship. And so it was, a, it was an ongoing dialogue. Um, and so uh, Dave Dolan from DCA had, had always been a an unofficial advisor to the company and, and became an official advisor and sort of, if you will, herded the cats of uh, Iconic and, and other uh, well-heeled investors. Um, this, it wasn't a point in time where the team was interested in a you know strategic exit. Uh, Scott wanted, you know, he, he sort of learned what a second bite at the apple, uh, third bite at the apple could, you know, could in fact look like and was pretty enamored with that. And the team wanted to continue uh, running the business and, and growing and scaling truckstop.com. So we didn't run a, you know, a broad strategic oriented ed process. It was a, uh, a very close knit uh, situation where Iconic and a handful of folks uh, were, who were circling the business and showed proactive interest um, made a proposal. And, you know, sadly for us, because of the friendship and, and partnership uh, made sense for us to kind of take, take a step back and, and uh, hand over the reins to uh, Iconic and Ferris's team fully. Yeah, it was in many ways the worst kept secret in the industry that Truck Stop was uh, positioned, but it was a lot of investors really uh, were pretty aggressively interested in the Truck Stop story, uh, as we talked to both during the process and after. A lot of them during the process wouldn't talk, but certainly after. I, I'm curious, as that sort of came together for, for you, uh, Paris, you guys chose uh, the, the iconic investment. Obviously, valuation is very important and, and what they're willing to put into the company, as well as to uh, into uh, you know, Scott and the team. Uh, you guys were able to get uh, what's reported or rumored is over a billion or nearly a billion dollars uh, for truck stop. That that must be a heck of accomplishment, but also a big level of responsibility for you to to live up to the valuation and continue to grow it. Yeah, uh, it's uh, you know for us it's it's been very similar to our transaction with Bergal Sagemount uh, when when we. Uh, went out and, and started talking with uh, uh, investors. 
just like we did with Bregal, uh, we were focused on a great partner more than anything else, more, more than the valuation, more than uh, what, um, you know, uh, the network or other things. It was really about the individuals that we'd be working with. And, and so uh, Iconic's been fantastic. Uh, uh, and, and the transition really hasn't been that difficult. I, I would say it, it really just feels like a continuation uh, of what we were doing with the, um, the Bregal Sage Mount team. And, and uh, one of the things that, or I would say the biggest difference more than anything else is just uh, where we're at in our maturity as a company. Uh, with uh, Sage Mount, we had just brought out uh, our, our pro product and we were heavily focused on, on sales. And, and so we made a large investment in our, our sales and marketing team. Now where we're at, we've got new innovations that we're bringing to market. And, and so we've made heavy investments in our product and development team. And our, we, we've seen some of those already uh, with our Book It Now product. And we've got uh, uh, new products that we'll be bring, bringing out here shortly uh, that we feel can really help our, our customers and help the industry. So the transition's been relatively easy. Uh, you know, they're, they're great people, just like uh, Phil and the team have been uh, great for us. So thankfully, you know, I, I, we've had a, a great transition. Ferris, is there any element of being, you know, to, to taking the investment from Iconic, a firm that's, you know, in Silicon Valley, uh, funded by a lot of really successful uh, internet entrepreneurs. Uh, does that help in terms of giving you guys technology guidance and that sells motion and the, the machine that is truck stop sales team? It, it, it has. It, it, it's been uh, great for our team to network with uh, either other portfolio companies of Iconic or people within uh, their, their family office. And, and so we've been able to for example, our our product and development leaders have been able to speak with individuals that uh, normally we wouldn't have access to, and, and certainly not from uh, New Plymouth or from Boise. And, and so to, to have access to these individuals, to learn from the things that they've done as they scaled their businesses uh, has been invaluable for us. Um, and, and that's one of just many things that Iconic brings to the table, but it, their network has, has been really incredible for us. Is there any difference working for a, or I shouldn't say working because it's still your business, but working with uh, an investor based in New York versus one that's based in the Valley? Uh, in this case, uh, there really hasn't been that much difference. Uh, I know with some firms, they, they, they can be, uh, be different, but uh, for us, it, it, it's, it's been very similar. And, and honestly, that was one of the things that attracted us to Iconic is, is it felt very similar, or our discussions with them felt very similar to our discussions with, uh, with the Sage Mount team. Well, Iconic's had a heck of a run. Uh, Snowflake, they were one of the investors. Reportedly, their investment in Snowflake that went to IPO earlier this year is the largest venture investment in history. I don't know if that's true. Uh, certainly it, uh, rumored to be uh, uh, above what the Facebook IPO was, but they would know something about that. I want to talk a little bit about what's next for truck stop you got this investment with iconic that can certainly uh hold that investment for a long time but is there an ipo uh, uh in your future paris you know we're, we're not focused on uh the outcome uh the the same thing that we did with uh with sage Mount, with phil and the team we're focused on building the very best company that we can in, in providing the most value to our customers that's possible and we, we feel that if we can do that, the outcome will take care of itself, uh, whatever that may be. And, and so I, I try not to get too, too focused on uh, you know, that, that next outcome. Uh, I, I really honestly do believe that it will take care of itself if, if we build a, a great business. And uh, I, I love optionality. And if, if, if we continue on the path that we're headed down, uh, all options are available to us. Uh, IPO just might be one of them. Well, best of luck in that process. Uh, Phil, I want to ask you, um, you've, you guys have been making a lot of investments. You've talked about some of the deals that you guys have done in logistics and freight tech, um, a lot of activity. Uh, there's also been a really hot IPO market. You've uh, been involved in the SPAC elements uh, or SPAC listings. What is, what's going on in the IPO market that you're seeing? 
never believed I would tell you this, Craig, on, on April 1st when we were working on uh, <laughs> scenario planning and liquidity management for our portfolio companies the in case of glass, you know, in, case, in case of emergency break class plans. But uh, uh, we actually were involved with two IPOs, one of our portfolio companies out of our opportunities fund, Zoom Info, went public via the traditional route, and then open lending uh, out of our equity fund went public via the, via the SPAC route. So I would say um, it's interesting to me, I, uh, when I started my career back in the late 90s at, at Alex Brown, SPAC was a four-letter word that less than attractive companies used to use to backdoor their way into to IPO scenarios. I'll tell you that's changed meaningfully. North of $50 billion has been raised in, in SPAC vehicles this year, and really high-class, high-caliber companies are going public via the, via the SPAC route, uh, whether it's Health Plan or DraftKings or Open Lending, companies that could easily hire the who's who of the investment banking world to take them out in the traditional IPO are, are choosing this back route. And and frankly, you get to the same place, open lending trades on, on NASDAQ with great uh, institutional investors and, and a, a great group of research analysts. And, uh, you know, as a, as a profitable business, didn't need uh, the capital via traditional IPO pathway for, for show capital on the balance sheet, um, given their, you know, their, their operating margins. And so it, it was, it was a way to, uh, for them to accomplish their goals and, and get to the get to the same spot, so it's been been fun to watch the open lending team succeed as a public company. Now, Phil, the, we 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 often think about the opportunities that exist uh, for freight waves and opportunities, but in terms of inbound interest uh, to us, how should we evaluate an IPO process? I think, like Paris said, if you embrace the journey and continue to build the business, you know, great things will happen. Uh, I think whether you're talking SPAC or IPO, there has been a market shift up. And you know, when I started my career, if you were you know a company valued at three or four hundred million, it was quite uh, viable to go public and get really interesting, you know, boutique, if not you know, bulge bracket investment banking research analysts following you. That that has real really clicked up to the you know the billion dollar plus uh, market. And so I think when you feel when you feel like your market cap is is comfortably you know north of a billion, it's a very you know interesting pathway to to accomplish. But whether you consider a traditional IPO or the SPAC route, the end result you know if successful ends up being the same. You have all of the the good and bad that comes with being a public company: the, the quarterly reporting, the analysts calls, the uh, the grilling that comes with uh, quarterly reporting, et cetera. And so I would just encourage, you know, all teams, yours is, yours included, are just to, you know, project yourself into that uh, public company seat and and figure out if that's something you're fired up about. And if you are, go for it. Does it, uh, you talked about the, the threshold uh, increasing. What Where does the revenue threshold in terms of ARR, just general revenues have to be to sort of get that billion dollar valuation from what you see? Probably the simple math is roughly 100 million of ARR. When when you get there and you can apply, you know, public multiples, then uh, that that's probably an, an area. I'd, you know, I I'd sort of just a g generic reaction I'd, I'd give you. Uh, but it's all idiosyncratic to each each unique deal. I'm sure uh, Dolan, uh, Dave Dolan, will have an opinion on uh, the investment market when we're ready to have those conversations. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate you uh, coming today to talk about the process. There's a lot of exciting uh, opportunities ahead in the logistics uh, market, uh, and we really appreciate the work that you guys are doing at Truck Stop and recognize uh, uh, the the opportunities that you're bringing to your customer base, uh, as well as the investment that Sagemont is making. Uh, and the opportunities that exist. So guys, thank you so much for coming on uh, to our uh, Venture Summit here today. Thanks, Thanks Greg. Great to see you guys.